Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. As noted in your webinar description for today's talk, this webinar intends to provide an overview of an operational definition of specific learning disability with a particular emphasis on the evaluation of cognitive processes. Uh, the goal is for you to also learn today about the relationship between specific cognitive abilities and reading, writing, and math achievement, and how to use knowledge of these relationships to inform your SLD assessment practices. I thought a good place to start, given that we're talking about SLD identification, is with the federal definition of SLD, which is likely familiar to most of us, but to remind us the federal government defines a specific learning disability as a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes that are involved in understanding or using language, be it spoken or written, which will manifest itself in the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematical calculations. And we know that such terms include conditions as perceptual disabilities, brain injury, minimal brain dysfunction, dyslexia, and developmental aphasia. Now, federal regulations currently, they permit the use of a pattern of strengths and weaknesses model. So school districts and practitioners can use this pattern of strengths and weaknesses model in determining whether or not a student exhibits an SLD. And in this model, the evaluation documentation that we're tasked with gathering must consider whether the student exhibits the pattern of strengths and weaknesses in performance, in achievement, or in both cognitive and academic performance. And we're comparing this relative to age or grade standards or overall global functioning. It's determined by the group that included in the assessment would be appropriate instruments that are relevant to the identification of SLD. Now, there are several different patterns of strengths and weaknesses model. All of them typically have inclusionary criteria and main elements of the model. So I wanted to go over a few of these. Firstly, in any of the models, there's a specific academic weakness that must be documented. There's also a specific cognitive weakness, and by virtue of the definition we just presented, that's included under the federal definition that it is truly a disorder in a basic psychological process, so we would expect that there would be a cognitive weakness that we're able to document. Now, these weaknesses are not attributed primarily to any exclusionary criteria that's also included in the federal definition. And we'll review what these exclusionary factors are later. But again, neither the academic or the cognitive weakness can be primarily explained by an exclusionary factor. The cognitive abilities and processes that you're assessing are in the average range or higher generally those that are least related to the areas of academic weakness would expected would be expected to be at least typical or average. So this is the otherwise normal ability profile standard, and your pattern of cognitive strength suggests at least average overall cognitive ability. And what this really means is that we're not dealing with children who have a general learning difficulty. We're not talking about intellectual disability with overall depressed cognitive performance. We're talking about circumscribed cognitive weaknesses that exist in a context of, as we said, otherwise average ability. Now, there may be some academic skills that are in the average range or higher, especially those that are obviously not implicated in the referral concern. And there are research-based or ecologically valid links between the academic and cognitive weaknesses. And again, we'll talk about this as we move on in today's talk. But essentially, it's not just um, you are not tasked with just finding any academic and any cognitive weaknesses. They have to be related logically or empirically. And then finally, of course, the specific learning dis disability pattern is only supportive of the diagnosis when other data sources converge in a manner consistent with what's known about SLD. And when we talk about cognitive processes today, We'll go through this convergence of indicators, and we'll really talk about cognitive functioning not only as it's assessed by standardized batteries, 
but how would a cognitive deficit in a particular domain be expected to manifest in the real world? So we'll cover some manifestations of each of the cognitive ability areas that we'll discuss today. Now, PSW methods are also referred to as third method approaches. And as you may know, there are several third method approaches. I'm going to talk today about one that I was uh, involved in the development of early on with Dr. Don Flanagan, Sam Ortiz, and Vincent Alfonso. There have been several revisions to this model, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but there are several other models, and there are certainly, if you can see at the bottom of your slide, there are tests um, that are now aligned with allowing you to complete a pattern of strengths and weaknesses analysis. So this approach, this third method approach, um, really works well with some of our existing batteries, the ones that you're likely already using to evaluate the cognitive processes that are implicated in SLD assessment. Now, conceptually, irrespective of the model that you subscribe to, there are similarities among these approaches. So I want to talk briefly about these similarities. So as we said earlier, there's a cognitive weakness or deficit that's present in a cognitive ability or a processing domain. There's an academic weakness or failure that's been documented in either academic skills, knowledge, um, fluency, acquisition, any one of the eight areas of SLD. These difficulties exist, as we said, in the context of at least average overall ability and otherwise normal ability profiles. And the cognitive weaknesses and academic weaknesses are related to one another empirically or logically. So there's your consistency. And the dual discrepancy is really that the cognitive weakness is outside and below most other cognitive domains. And the academic weakness is similarly outside and below most other um, cognitive domains that were assessed. Now, for our purpose today, we will consider the entire model, but obviously, uh, given today's title of our talk, we're going to focus on the left-hand side with the cognitive processes and really talk about how um, these processes can be assessed, how practitioners can take a step-by-step -step approach to considering which abilities should be included or analyzed specifically in the um, SLD evaluations. So to add more structure to our talk, I want to talk about the assessment of cognitive abilities in the context of the operational definition of specific learning disability. And as I had just mentioned, the definition was first presented in 2002 and updated in 2006, again a year later, um, with the uh, publication of the second edition of cross-battery assessment, there was an update. And then revisions occurred in 2011, and most recently in the third edition of cross-battery assessment, um, it has been renamed the dual discrepancy consistency model. This is an example of the model you're seeing on your screen. It's um, a, a table that appears in the Essentials of Cross-Battery third edition. Some of you may be familiar with it. And the model is a multi-tiered model, and there are five levels. So we have five separate levels. The criteria must be met at each level before rendering an SLD diagnosis. So while our talk today is not so much centered on global diagnosis, it's really important to understand the levels of this model and the documentation that's required at each level. And once we briefly review each level, we can revisit Level 3 and 4, which together focus on the assessment of cognitive processes and that patterns of strength and weakness analysis that we just talked about. So if you look for a second across the top columns, you'll see the far left column denotes the level that we're considering. The second column describes the nature of SLD at that level. What does it typically look like at that particular level? Then we have information about the focus of evaluation. What should we be doing? What should we be looking at um, at each of these levels? And then not only what do you need to assess, but how? What are some examples of evaluation methods and data sources that could allow you um, to evaluate what is suggested that needs to be evaluated at each of the levels? And then finally, you have the criteria for each level. What must you meet? Um, at each level to move forward, continue to move forward to the next 
um, level in the model. Each one is, is a necessary element that must be met until we get to the you know, fifth level. And the fifth level, as we'll talk about later, we will go through each of these levels, but that's really the divide between the clinical question of SLD and the legal question in the school because at level five you're determining special education eligibility. And that's our legal question as to whether or not the child has deficits that cannot otherwise be remediated, accommodated, or compensated for in the context of um, general education setting without the provision of specialized tailored uh, education services. So now I want to go through each level. Um, I'm going to start with level one. As I said, we'll go all the way through level five. And at the end of this brief overview, we will then go back and revisit level three and four more carefully. So level one is just the basic understanding that the nature of SLD is that there's evidence of difficulties or deficits in one or more areas of academic achievement. And we know that there are eight areas specified presently under federal law, which include basic reading skill, reading comprehension, reading fluency, oral expression, listening comprehension, written expression, math calculation, and math problem solving. So given that SLD involves an academic weakness, our evaluation would focus firstly on assessing academic achievement. And again, while achievement is not a sole focus of today's talk, it's important to know the area of suspected disability and that it should be fully assessed. So you don't have a reading referral and give one measure of word reading. You need to assess the academic domains broadly in each area of suspected LD. So if you find that you have reading as your referral and math is intact, you know, some of us will give a global achievement battery, but we might suggest math may not require as extensive an evaluation, and we use other extant data to suggest or support intact skills, math grades, history, a report card comment, um, but typically at this level a comprehensive um, evaluation is given using Wyatt 3, uh, excuse me, this wasn't updated to WJ4, but uh, it would be the WJ4, KT3, and other special purpose measures um, that we would focus on. Now as I just said, evaluating at level one, there are several ways we can evaluate. Performance on the norm reference standardized achievement test is obviously um, primary because we're comparing children to that uh, general person standard based on age and grade norms. But you can benefit at level one by examining other data sources. So progress monitoring data, evaluating work samples, observing academic performance, looking at results of teacher, parent, student interviews, and then just other historical or archived data and then multidisciplinary team members, of course, in the context of a building level referral um, can fill in information about the child's functioning in an academic domain that would support um, or likely offer secondary support for your primary test findings. Now meeting the criteria at this level involves simply documenting that performance is weak or deficient as evidenced by those converging data sources that we just spoke of. And you can use results, obviously, from intra-achievement variation procedures as one data source, especially when that academic area identified as a weakness has the associated standard score that is weak or deficient. So again, today's talk isn't so much about looking at normative functioning and what is a normative weakness, but I think most of us appreciate that we sometimes will do an intra-achievement variation and we'll have a significant difference or finding, but the lower of the two scores is not normatively weak. For this level and for our purpose in the operational definition, we're talking about normative weaknesses. Now at level two, the nature of SLD is such that we're going to evaluate exclusionary criteria because specific learning disability does not include a learning problem that's the result of a visual, hearing, or motor disability, of intellectual disability, of a social or emotional disturbance, or of other factors that are, relate to environment, education, culture, or economic disadvantage. So at this level, we're concerned with evaluating what's known as exclusionary criteria, what SLD is not. So the focus of the evaluation 
are just identifying what could be other potential primary causes of the student that you're evaluating their academic skill weaknesses or deficits. And these 